So as you get your hymnals out, if you would bow or kneel with me wherever possible, we will look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, O Lord, for this evening. Thank you for the physical food that you have given us, O Lord. Father, now we look again to you for spiritual food. Before we start, O God, we'd like to ask that you come in and purify our hearts and that you would indeed send your angels to sing with us so that we can offer you praise that is acceptable in your sight. Please, O oh Lord, help us that we may learn more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 532, day by day. Five six nine, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Five six nine.
thou my vision, 547, be thou my vision. As we learn all of this, we want the Lord to be our vision and our guide, 547. We can all stand for an opening for this. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Lord, be all else to me, say that thou art. Thou my best, Lord, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping. This evening we have Sister Raven White who's gonna make a, give us another presentation. Let me see the hands of you who enjoyed her presentation this morning. Not just for a good word spoken, but something that you can actually apply practically to your life. I know I learned a couple of things, you know. And this was a very, a very good blessing for us as women to come together and to hear this and to have the support of the rest of our family and brothers and sisters in the church. Um, she's going to come before us, but before she comes to you, I will do a special song, He Touched Me, and I pray that you could meditate on those words and that whatever we hear here today, that it will be like him touching us and making us completely whole. Let's leave here differently. how to involve their families. Uh, so hopefully I will cover really what I feel that the Lord has shown me, what true medical missionary work is, that I have seen lacking and missing a lot of times in the ministry. But don't be shocked where we start. <laughs> I believe because the Spirit of Prophecy said that we are commissioned agents for the saving of souls of people. 
I called it commissioned agents. <laughs> Who are you? Who are you? A child of God, but a child of God as a high priest, temple of God, letters read by men. What's your purpose? And you can talk back to me. That too, but spread it through the image of God, through the Holy Spirit. Now, I wanted to stress that one of the things our world is struggling with, especially in the church, is righteousness by faith versus righteousness by works, okay? As medical missionaries, we are trying to help people truly understand how to utilize God and not try to just be the workers ourselves. We can't heal anybody, we can't save anyone, we don't have a heaven or hell to put anyone in. So some of the challenges that we have as Christians is trying to do it all ourselves and even save our own selves. But to learn how to actually have righteousness and faith in God is a little bit much more difficult. And this is why it's important when I say, when you're trying to live out your faith, do it through the Holy Spirit. It makes a huge difference, and then I'll explain to you why. Some of the characteristics of God's image is of his character is patience, meekness, long-suffering, mercy, and being wise. Now you will learn this. As a medical missionary going out to help people, people will test your patience. They will test you good. Because see, they believe you should work for free. They, should, they believe that you should be a slave. <laughs> you should just do whatever they ask for nothing. <laughs> And they, they talk and they treat you as if, you know, why aren't you a Christian? And it tests your patience. It really does. When you're trying to do the work of the Lord, but then you have to keep in mind, if the Holy Spirit haven't led you to do it, a lot of times, a lot of the battles you're facing is not something that's won. And that's why it's imperative to know when God is leading you to do something and when he's not. Because if he's leading you to do it, the Holy Spirit will help you have those characteristics. He will prepare you for battles that are already won. Because that's what Jesus did. He was silenced when he was accused. He was abused. He kept Judas around. And he knew who Judas was. Okay? Forgiveness and the parables. But this is a definition, because a lot of people say, I want to be patient. Keep this in mind what that means. That means to bear pain, trials, commonly without, without complaint. Okay? Meekness, to endure injury with patience, without resentment. So a lot of times we're thinking, you know, I should just be a medical missionary and help people with their health, utilizing natural remedies, but we forget the characteristics. So when we're interacting with people, and especially when they cross us wrong, <laughs> And they will cross you wrong. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to learn how to be merciful and have some compassion and be wise because a lot of people will ask for things that are hindrous, I mean, that are just completely against God's working for the body. But they are wanting you to come help them do that or they don't want to listen to you. And it's okay, like Jesus have told the disciples, you brush the dust off your shoes. And you keep walking. And you have to pray about that and leave it up to God. We are not to try to be gods for people. So that is one of the things I want to stress to you because the characteristic of Christ is a big thing to have in this work. So our blueprint, of course, comes, like I said, from the sanctuary. Everything we do is from the sanctuary. Now, keeping this in mind, and I want to run through this so we can stress it, it is imperative you get up every day dying to your own desires and wants and how you're going to handle the day. Where are you going to go? How are you going to speak? It says in Luke 21, verse 14 and 15, do not meditate beforehand on what you'll speak, for God will give you wisdom and mouth to speak so your enemies cannot gainsay or resist. Matthew and Mark said it's not you speaking but the Holy Spirit. It is imperative we start our day saying it's not about me and what I already know. Okay? The next thing is make sure you're into your word because that is cleansing you, that it's really causing the battle when you do get people or attitudes or things. Satan will have someone hit you, 
People have someone to take your money. People have stolen from us. I've had someone at Wildwood walk up and down the aisle of our, um, our hallway, cuss me out, up and down the hallway. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, you paid $3,000 to come here, tell me you're going to go to Crackle Barrel and eat some chicken, and you, do you, you paid $3,000 to come here for that? <laughs> but it happens, okay? And your pride cannot get up. You need the spirit of God within you, cleansing you, to prepare you for things like that, because it happens. Um, as well as, like I said, Jesus did not speak his own words. You just need to speak God's words, and it will. People want to rebuke God? Let them. That's between them and God. But when you start speaking your own words, you put yourself in something. People are changed by the word of God, not by yours. The next one is prayer. Be a person of prayer. Remember, Jesus was given his very words for that day, but it also calms us. When it says in Romans 8, verse 6 and 7, that the carnal mind has enmity, that's hatred towards God, is not subject to his law, neither indeed can be. We, we continually need Jesus to help us in moments. I have moments where I have to pray. And this one woman, my dad, he passed away, I think it was, only two months by this time, and she felt, she said, Raven, I feel impressed to tell you this because I don't know the next time I need to tell you this, but I want to tell you just to get over it, Raven, just get over it. And it really threw me because I was sitting thinking to myself, well, I, I didn't come ask you anything. Why are you doing this? But I had a multitude of people for at least a year after my, oh, from the time he died <laughs> to the time of a year later, People just kept feeling like Raven, you know, my dog died too. <laughs> what your dog got to do with my dad? And, you, and I'm telling you, there are moments where I've had to stop, and one of my friends, he was bold. He said, maybe you just cuss him out, just cuss one person out. <laughs> just cuss one person out, they'll get it all. And I said, no, no. But I have to admit, one Sabbath, when she did that to me, it was Sabbath, I literally looked at her and I kept saying, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, Jesus, 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 because I literally had this rage come in me. Rage. And I tell you, I didn't, I, did, I had to look over and I saw the homeless people I brought to church with me and I said, okay, okay. But I'm telling you, it was deep in my heart. I said, Jesus, if you don't catch my heart by tomorrow, I'm telling you now, by tomorrow, I got her. So you better capture my heart today. <laughs> And I prayed, and I think sometimes we want to believe that just because we pray and read the Bible, the feelings will go away, and everything's going to be okay. You have to die to self, and sometimes you're the one that has to strangle yourself, <laughs> okay? I had to do that, and I realized that is the only way that I'm able to tell someone else who sees their child killed, because you run into that, you know? Or they've been evicted from their homes, or something tragic happens to them. What are you going to tell them? You have to say, my God can hold if you just scream, cry, holler, whatever it takes. Hold on to him. Because he knows you're hurting. Don't act like it doesn't hurt just because you believe in God. And you'll find that people will open up their lives to you because now you are meeting them where they are. Okay? And have the mind of Christ. All right, you have the presence of God and the mercy and the law. So the next time you do see a young lady not dressed properly or you see a young man not act, acting properly, what would God do? And a lot of times he was, we, would, we should have the mindset to say, Lord, what happened to that person before I saw them right now? What happened in their home to make them act like that? Because there's always a reason for people's Trials, agony, upset, and bitterness that is now lashing out at you. And it's not really you, you know? But God will give you that wisdom because he knows what's happening in people's lives. The, being a true medical missionary, I'm telling you, you will deal with it all and it has nothing just to do with giving them a poultice. We are called to help people with their spiritual health, okay? Because the whole point is we just don't want to see them in hell, <laughs> okay? So I looked up the original language for yoke. And when it says take, take my yoke, it really means just prayer and worship, spending time with God. When it says I'll take your yoke, it is really our trials, our anger, our bitterness, our pains. So personally, I feel that the gospel is really God's yoke. The sanctuary message is his yoke. 
If we can take that daily, he'll take everything else. You're seeking him first, all righteousness will be added unto you. And that's my belief system. And that's what we need to teach people. If you're not putting it in your own personal life, you can't teach someone else. It just comes across fake. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 through 19. This is the armor that we need to put on daily. I don't know if anyone has that scripture. Um, I want you to actually open it up because I'm going to show you this scripture through the sanctuary. This is something God showed me that I was actually pretty excited about. <laughs> I'm like, I get a kid to can't it's over the sanctuary. You'll find it out. Um, are you there? Um, Ephesians chapter 6, I think it's verse 14 through 19. The armor of God. This is what we all should be putting on daily and dealing with people, especially ourselves. <laughs> okay, we're there? Okay. So the first scripture, it says, the foot is should with the gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace. I truly believe when you get up every day to decide you're going to die to self because Jesus died for you, you are preparing yourself to teach people about the gospel of peace, to let your own burdens down. When you start to get into the word of God, he will start to girt your loins with truth. When you actually start to read his word and study him, you will have the sword of the spirit. His prayer life is your breastplate of righteousness. The witnessing of God is your shield of faith. And the ark of the covenant is your helm of salvation. You should always be able to find God and his sanctuary through the word of God. It is all there. And so we are the agency appointed for men's salvation, organized to carry the gospel to the world. So who will go forth? Someone must be commissioned. And that's what God is trying to say. I'm commissioning you. This is a job that not just Seventh-day Adventists will do. All Christians are supposed to do it, but definitely we as a church we have come to a time that every member of the church, I think we've heard this before, every member of the church should take hold of the medical missionary work. The world is a laser house filled of victims of both physical and spiritual disease. I truly believe bipolarism, depression, all of those things come when people have, I don't think people understand what stress can do. I think we utilize that word so loosely that we don't understand that arteries are closing when a person is stressed, okay? Five minutes of anger weakens your white blood cells for up to five hours. You understand the damage that is happening to a person's brain when arteries are closing and there's no white blood cells and there's no circulation going to the brain? Bipolarism is not something that, that cannot be changed. I have a a God sister that's bipolar, and I had a friend I went to seminary with that was bipolar, and the only way they can stay calm without medication was to read the Bible. As long as they were reading the Bible, they were fine. As soon as she stopped, hell was at everybody's door. She was vicious. She would jump up on tables in courtrooms and beat down people and hit them. But if you just get her in front of a Bible, she was good. She read the Bible, she was fine. Anytime she stopped, that was a problem. You'll find a lot of people who are bipolar will drink or smoke because it helped the cerebral fluids calm and balance out. The problem is they get, become addicted, okay? So if, if alcohol can fix it, God can too. So the next thing says, everywhere people are perishing for a lack of knowledge of truths that have been committed to us. The members of the church are need, in, in need of an awakening that they may realize their responsibility to impart these truths. So I think it's good that we as a church are willing to actually make some action, but this needs to be something where God is telling us the Holy Spirit is not going to really set us in a church to not do anything. And when that happens, you have to stop and ask yourself, Lord, am I following too much of my nature? Because our nature is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? So when that happens, it's good to question and say, Lord, am I, am I holding more into myself? Please help me, okay? Medical missionary work will open all doors. It really will. You can talk to anyone about their health, and it will open doors. 
at any time. I mean, I don't have to know anyone. If I even tell people my business, it opens doors. <laughs> but if I talk to them about Jesus, I find more doors shut. And I was that way myself. I couldn't, you tell me Jesus loved me, I literally would curse at people. Because to me, who he was and all that I've been, is not love. But you got me through health. You got me through creationism and physiology. From that point on, you, got, you, you had me. But if you talk to me about just Jesus' love, that made no sense to me at all. So we should be sharing the third angel's message tied with the health message. And this is why I know that Satan has made a serious attack on our church, because how often do you hear about the health message? Now it was just that, L, we would serve cheese in the church. Now we're serving chicken. <laughs> And before it would never, you could come to the church and you would ever get meat in the, in the church. You could find it at people's homes. But when they start bringing it to the church, you start to say, where's the foundation for what we stand for as a Seventh-day Adventist church? Everything has become relative now. There's no absolute truth because now we're more concerned about not hurting your feelings than staying upon what the scripture or the Bible or the spirit of prophecy says. Or God's feelings. No one sees things from God's point of view. And that's, that's a danger I think we're in right now. The next thing, the third angel's message, telling people Babylon is fallen. But the ironic part is, if we have allowed, and this is not a, a push where the church is bad, I think the church has been infiltrated by Satan so much that we don't know that something has gone bad. Because truths are not being taught anymore. Again, like I said earlier this morning, we're allowing people to come in not teaching them truth, not impressing them to read their Bibles or study for themselves. So unless the pastor says it, when will they ever get it? You know what I'm saying? Satan is having a field day with us just trying to love one another without truly loving each other through truth. And I think that's where now, which is then you have people who know a lot of Bible and we're judging and hurting and beating down. The Bible says there's nothing wrong with saying something is right or wrong. But if you don't love them enough to die for them, you probably should not speak. If the Holy Spirit is not leading you to speak, those words will be held against you in judgment. But I don't ever say we should never not say something because I think that's unloving as well. Okay, because someone's going to mock and do them wrong and say something wrong to them and judge them harshly and we put them out there without being prepared. So I believe that. But I believe we should study. I'm going to run through these because it's just long quotes to say the gist of, you need to start studying, okay? The doctors don't know everything. When you have a problem, they go back and read the book too. So it's nothing wrong, start getting materials. One of the things I love, I get these cookbooks, but don't just get general cookbooks. I mean, this cookbook has, this is called, um, one of the medical missionaries actually created it. Um, New Life Through Choice. I mean, get in there, get the eight laws of health. It talks about herbs, it talks about beverages. Get things that's simple, you know what I'm saying? That can make it very easy for you. Because a lot of people, when they want to know deep hospital stuff, a lot of times they don't need to know that deep stuff from you. They want to know the common, how do I get over this cold? I have a headache. You know, how do I cook some good food? I want some cheese, <laughs> but how do I make a dish without cheese? You know, sometimes we make things a little bit too complicated for ourselves when the average thing is just helping people in the small things that they can be related to, you know? Um, study the principles and also practice it in your life. So when you have a headache, do you go to Tylenol or do you go to a hot foot bath? Well, that's a hot foot bath for some. Most people go to Tylenol. And they know, they know that it's probably better to go to a hot foot bath, but they don't know how. You know what I'm saying? So it's something to start doing it to yourself. And if you ever want to bring your family upon something that they feel is so crazy, like medical missionary work, start giving them hot foot baths. When they're stressed out, start putting them in a neutral bath so it calms their nerves. You see what I'm saying? When they're in pain, give them turmeric or ginger. Start utilizing these things, and when you start seeing the proof, you'll be quick to be like, oh, I got something for you, boo-boo. Here, here, right here. <laughs> quick as day. The next thing is, here's some examples from the Bible. Fig poultice. Have you all done that yet? That's kind of good. It actually will heal. You got boils, you got any kind of pains, take some figs, crush it up, put it on you. Actually heals the pain, helps with the boils, helps with burns. Salt water, I know you have gargled with salt water before. Actually, if you have a toothache, brush your, brush your teeth. 
swish your mouth around with Himalayan salt. It helps with that. It cleanses. Washing in a Jordan, clearly that's hydrotherapy. <laughs> um, they put flour in poison stew because they just use wild herbs, which the flour bind up the other herbs. Because really, if you ever put flour in something, it starts to bind up and take the flavor of things. Well, that's what it did. It took the poisons of the herbs. That's what the flour did. It made dough and they threw it out. Um, and Jesus used clay, and this is my favorite one. Why is that so profound that Jesus used clay? Say that again. He made man out of clay. What else? Huh? Properties of clay. He's Jesus. <laughs> what did he need clay for? Do you know what I'm saying? There's another time he touched a man twice. He's Jesus. <laughs> what was the point of that? Examples. See, the thing is, he's leaving us examples. Now, granted, he said greater things we can do, but that's not the point. The point is connection. When you put clay on someone's body, you're actually touching them. You're connecting with them. You're, you're giving yourself sacrifice to be with them. That's the difference in medical missionary work. We can pray with people all day long, but that doesn't give us time with people and bonding with people because that's what's going to make us want to change and learn more about Jesus, ourselves, interacting with one another. What should we teach? Now, this is a deeper part. This is a deeper part. What should we teach? One, it takes faith. It's, you're going to have to start teaching people that like, I had this one gentleman, um, I was hoping he would come to church today, but he didn't. I have a lawyer who just asked me the other day about my faith, and of course, he just went on making all his comments, and I read parts of the Bible, and he said, la, 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 And I said, let me explain something. Did you read the whole Bible? He said, no. I said, then there's nothing you can say about my God. There's nothing you can say about my faith. There's nothing you can say about anything I stand for. You believe in science. You believe it came from nothing. Then I could believe in God and that he came from nothing. It's all faith. But this is what I'll tell you. Try it, and you tell me if you become what you see in this world that is doing it without God. Try it. And from there, he says, you know what? Then fine, I'll get a Bible and I'll start reading it, and you know, whenever you want me to come to church, I'll come to church. You know, Satan has some reason to try to get him not to come to church this morning. But the reality is, I never brought up you should come to church. You brought up you should come to church. And you mentioned it three or four times before I left your office that you should come to church <laughs> and that you want to buy a Bible. So my thing is, it's nothing wrong with being bold about who you are. You don't have to force them to be who you think they should be. But stay on your ground on who you are and say, you're not going to talk about my God now. <laughs> you can do whatever you want, but you're not going to talk about mine. And he actually liked that. He paid for more of my meter to talk to me some more. <laughs> Three causes of diseases, I want you to teach people that, and then the blueprint of restoration. So let's get into the three causes of diseases. Disease does not come without a cause, okay? So those who desire prayer for restoration to health, it should be made plain that the violation of God's laws, whether natural or spiritual, is sin, and that in order for them to receive his blessing, sin must be confessed and forsaken. They might, no? Y'all get that? Because, see, I have a wonderful brother, wonderful, who likes to drink, so he lost both kidneys. My other brother gave him a kidney. He lost another kidney. Now, why did he lose another kidney? Because he didn't want to stop drinking. And so now he's on dialysis and cannot get back on the kidney thing. Why? Because he doesn't want to stop drinking, and his heart now is messed up. And I sit there and I say, there's no need. There's, you, can, you can pray all you want. But if the person is not trying to change, especially the exact same thing that got them sick, what do you want God to do? When he can see the end from the beginning. So now I have one brother who's living just with one kidney. And who doctor just told him, and he told me last week, he said, Raven, they told me 
My, my, what's happening to me is not good, Raven. And I went back on everything you told me to do. But I'm, 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 I'm getting back on it, I'm getting back on it, I'm getting back on it. I said, I hope so. Because that would break my heart to have to lose my brother. You know? There are three causes for diseases. It's to the glory of God, a natural law is broken, or a spiritual law is broken. So for the natural law, the blind boy, they said, who sinned? You know that story? Yeah. Who sinned? He said, no one sinned. This is to the glory of God. Sometimes, especially with the death of Lazarus, sometimes we have to stop putting God in a human box because the doctors told you it was impossible. He's God. <laughs> if we're really going to believe that he created you, that you came out of a human body, you grew up. You came out of a, she's pregnant. <laughs> and you're going to have a doctor tell you <laughs> what you can't do and how you can't be healed? Seriously? No. And I remember they told me, Raven, you have two, you have diverticulitis and you'll be, you'll just have this for the rest of your life. And if you don't know what diverticulitis is, it's an intestinal disease. It's incurable. Even the natural book says incurable where your intestines inside of you have burst, burst out. The muscles have burst out inside my body. And they said it can never be fixed unless you do surgery. Now, if you do surgery, you may have some bowel obstructions after a while, or they may have to cut off like inches of your intestines. Um, you'll have moments where the reason why they found out I was sick, um, I just kept throwing up. I would throw up water. I couldn't eat, take, take down anything. I was just in pain all the time, and there's nothing I could do. And they said it's incurable. And so I said, that's all I need you to tell me is what is the actual disease, and I will show you my God. That's all I need. Mind you, I'm, this, is, this is, I'm fresh in the faith now, you know, fresh. <laughs> so I was like, I just need you to show me now. I'm, I'm going by faith here myself. And they said, no, no, even the doctors, health doctors, new medical missionary doctors said, Raven, it's not possible. I said, well, then that's what I'm going to do. When I prove you wrong, then I want you to tell God that. Within a year or two, they did the test again. Amen. They said that they only see one diverticulum. Amen. Now, mind you, it was spread throughout my whole intestines. And they said, well, then you never had diverticulitis, lightus. I said, well, this is all I know. I don't have the machine to tell me I had it. And I didn't have the machine to tell me I didn't. That's all I have. They said, well, you know, your fibroids, because I had a multitude, bundles of them. And they said, ah, yeah you're just gonna to have to get surgery and you have to take out your, your um, uterus. I said, well, you know, this is what we'll do. I'm gonna come back in a year. <laughs> and I'm gonna see what God says, and then we'll talk. Amen. I came back in a year. They said, we don't see any fibroids. <laughs> I didn't think you would. <laughs> now, if they were there, my God is still faithful. Okay? Sometimes he allows you to get sick to show God's power. So it can get a little frustrating because, trust me, those going into a hot, bubbling water for, for five minutes, then for two minutes, and then going to ice bucket cold water for 30 seconds, for one minute. And I did that for five changes for weeks and weeks on, taking Chaseberry tea and molasses every day and you get tired you can't eat certain things you can't eat anything with you i mean it was just like you get tiring of taking all these herbs you feel like you're taking medication it's almost a still set it's 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 nerve-wracking but i don't have fibroids <laughs> and i don't have diverticulums i have one diverticulum left and i i guess i would have to go back and see if that one's gone now but the key is god is powerful so don't let people tell you anything until the Lord tells you that I need you to have this Amen. for my glory, okay? Amen. The next one is a natural law, okay? Like, it says the gentleman who was paralyzed, when God says thy sins, you know, are forgiven, that means he did something, okay? So that means if I say I'm depressed, one of the first questions I would ask is, what time are you going to bed at night? What are you eating? Do you drink enough water? Do you get out in the sun? 
What are you watching on television? Because a lot of those things can cause depression. And that's a natural law you're breaking, you know? Um, as well as the man who was at Bethesda. He said, don't go back to your old ways for you will be, or a worse thing will happen unto you. It's like, you know, the house is swept and seven more demons come back. It's the same thing sometimes with our illnesses. Don't go back to what God has healed you from. It is, it is imperative because we are a living witness. We can go out and say, see, the Lord healed me, and I did that myself. And this is why I'm now back up to 200 pounds. Because Raven thought, after I got down to 160, I can go back and eat a third meal. <laughs> this is what I learned about the human brain. Let's say I stop a habit right here, okay? And I start on a new habit. If I choose down this line to pick up the habit again, what happens is the neurotransmitters of the brain that I had to fight, it's a hard fight to make a new pathway. But by the time you make it, you're good. But if you go back, it literally as if you erase that pathway. And the strength of this <laughs> horrible habit kicks in like none other and it almost as if it's harder to break and it has taken me over three or four years to try to get off of eating a third meal and as much as I try to lose weight I tell you it's hard <laughs> because if you eating two meals a day is good unless you're really active the average person don't need two meals a day and I definitely don't need two meals a day and I don't eat just fruit I wish I could eat just bread and fruit. I don't. I like chips. I want my beans. I want my nuts. I, you know, there's, there's, when you go back to an old habit, you also go back to characteristics of intemperance. So watch what you do and watch what you feed into. The human brain is very sadly in sin, easy to go back to something negative than to try to do something positive. All right. This is the big one. Do not pray for the sick unless you give them instruction. I saw the reason why God did not hear the prayers of his servants for the sick among us more fully was that he could not be glorified in doing so while they were violating the laws of health. I mean, we, we can pray all day long. Just, just don't even do it. So here's the spiritual law. Paying tithe and offering, okay? Don't mess with God's money. I know that the conference probably is taking our money and buying computers. I know that they probably are misappropriating it. If you just stick to the scriptures, the scripture says bring the money into the storehouse. The scriptures also says that the tithe was also to support the pastors. Even our conference allow you to give money for tithe to amazing facts. But use I stick in the line of what the scripture says. So I'm going to bring my money to the storehouse, and I'm also going to make sure I support pastors because this is to finish the work. And this is what our pastor taught up here, that the pastors were not supposed to sit here and just preach at one church. <laughs> they were supposed to be starting churches, reaching out, ministering, doing the work. Right. Satan has made them sit here and just keep talking to the That's same right. people over and over again. That's, right. That's not God's way. Mm. Okay, so when you're out there doing the work, I want to support that. When the conference don't want to support you, I don't care. I'm going to support you right. because it's God's money, so God is supporting you. Yeah. That's one thing. Don't mess with God's money. Okay? Bring it to the storehouse, though, or you support a pastor. Um, Second Samuel, David slept with another, one, another man's wife, killed the husband, got the wife pregnant, and the child had to die. Okay? Did anybody stay up late at night? No. But they broke a spiritual law. Yeah. Okay, a multitude in this one. I think the next thing that really gets people, me more than anything else, it was not about that she was talking about this woman because of her race. The scripture says, how dare you talking about my servant, Moses? And she got leprosy. That's serious. So the Lord had to tell me because I am not going to lie to you. I can talk about you. I can talk about you up and down. And I've had a spirit of negativity that God had to rebuke seriously in my soul. I am convinced that the majority of my sickness came from my negativity and unforgiveness. When I had heartburn for two and a half years, 
I mean, my, my chest felt like it had holes in it, mm. burning to my back. I was scared to drink water. That's how painful it was. And God had to tell me that they did an endoscopy. They said, your esophagus is perfect. I said, that can't be true. I mean, I was tears in my eyes because I'm in pain now. Mm. And I got on my knees and said, God, please, what did I do wrong? He said, as long as you hold on forgiveness in your heart, you'll always be sick. Mm -hmm. Physiology, the brain can actually stir up the digestive juices in the stomach mm -hmm. and cause you to have ulcers. Mm -hmm. The brain can also start weakening your white blood cells just from your thoughts. Trust and believe. Mm -hmm. Negativity is not good. So I've learned that the Lord has taught me, do not speak against God's leaders. Amen. Okay, David, even though Saul was no longer a part of God, still David even knew, don't touch God's anointed. God is to take down the leader. That's not my job. Okay? Don't touch the Lord's anointed. Don't gossip. Okay? Your words will be held against you in judgment. Make sure your words are life. There's life. My mother taught me the scripture. Um, uh, life and death is in the tongue. Okay? So you want to watch what we're saying. Um, go to the person. You got a problem? Go to the person. Don't back bet against the, the, the conference or the pastors. Because in the end... This is really the truth of the matter. Oh, yes, we're all screwed up. There are, we all got some issues, but we're all in need of Jesus. And I used to say this about Osama bin Laden. If Jesus could change Paul and see what Paul did, he wrote half of the, really, a lot of the, the, old, old test, the New Testament. What could he have done to a man who could sit down and tell you to get on the plane and blow yourself up? He's not on the plane blowing himself up. But he can tell you to do it. You want that kind of power on your side. <laughs> we need to be praying for people who are truly being led by Satan and may or may not know it, you know? Um, and also backbiting against the Holy Spirit in the spirit of prophecy. I think I'm convinced to say that if you're going to be a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, our foundation is a belief in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Amen. I had someone tell me, you listen to Spirit of Prophecy? Do you know she was bobbing for apples on Halloween with kids? She ain't got a heaven or hell to put me in. Mm -hmm. I don't care what that woman did. Name me a prophet or anybody in the, except Jesus in the Bible that was perfect, that was not being perfected. She also didn't believe in the health message. She also argued about wanting to hold on to her meat. She also didn't believe in the Sabbath. She had to be taught that too. I don't care for that woman. I care for the Holy Spirit speaking through her. <clears throat> We're people. I'm not following people. But I take what I read from her, and I take it back to the Bible. And that's what my friends challenged me. I, ch I was very serious about that when I was very against the Adventist church, and I felt that Adventist church was of the Catholic church, and I was open about the death of Adventists. And my friend said, Raven, if you could just read her, and if you find one thing wrong with her, just take everything back to the compare to the Bible. If you can't find something to compare back to the Bible, no problem. Walk away from this church. Mm. And I found a few things. Personally, I did. And they were like, Raven, okay. Yeah, you're not going to find drinking eight glasses of water in the Bible, Raven. You're not. <laughs> I said, but you said I could take it back. <laughs> and I was. I was being tit for tat because... My thing is, if you tell me something, I'm going to follow it. But in the end, I will say this. I had a third grade reading comprehension up to the age of 20. And I was in remedial classes from elementary up to my second year of college. So Columbia Union College, which is now in Washington at Venice University, was the only school that I found that would allow me to take remedial classes in college. So I was still learning how to write a sentence properly, and they still kept doing one plus one, and it was so embarrassing. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that I could understand and read very well was the King James Version mm -hmm. and the Spirit of Prophecy. Amen. By my second year, my, my comprehension went up to college level. Amen. I tested out, Amen. and I got two bachelors in four years. 
And my, my teacher, my, the second degree, because they knew I couldn't write very well, I couldn't write paragraphs and sentences very well, he let me talk out my tests and papers. But I can read very well now based upon me reading just the Spirit of Prophecy. I didn't read any of the books. I couldn't, they were just too complex. But if I can read the Spirit of Prophecy and the King James Version, easy pie, easiest pie. And that's all I needed. That's all I needed. So, if anyone who is seeking health have been guilty of evil speaking, and they have sown discord in the home, the neighborhood, or the church, and have stirred up alienation and dissension, if by any wrong practice they have led others to sin, these things should be confessed before God and before those who have been offended. See, the thing is, this is not just about our church. When we're reaching out to people in the world, this is normal for them. Right. Talking about people gossiping, yeah. hating on each other, all of that's normal. And then they wonder why they're still not getting better. We have to teach them these truths. This is not just a church thing. This is a world thing, okay? So we have to teach people these truths. But we have to practice them as well, <laughs> okay? If we, confess our, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse, forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When wrongs have been righted, we may present the needs of the sick to the Lord in calm faith as his spirit may indicate. Okay, so this is what I say, the blueprint of completion of righteousness. See, when you finally are able to reach in and gather their hearts and their trust, then you want to be able to teach them about the sanctuary, but through just basic method of, yo, you know, just try to have some faith in God, you know, just Amen. try to die to self a little bit. Mm -hmm. Try, have faith, you know, whatever you can say in your own words, that's putting them up on the altar. Maybe you could try to read your Bible maybe once a day. You know, read a little scripture here and there. That's the labor. Just get it in. You see? You don't have to say, well, I'm going to teach you about the sanctuary today. <laughs> but this is how you talk to them. You teach them how to reach and let God reach them. Okay? So, but how specifically? What is medical missionary work practically? So, first of all, we need to live what we preach. Okay? Um... We need to set people free. Now, one of my friends brought this out to me, and I love it. Is this not the fast that I've chosen? To, choose, to loosen the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. This did not say, make sure you do a water fast. And I thought about this. My friend Kim right now, she's been struggling for over a year, just broken because her father passed away. No one, none, if they pay, paid attention, she barely left out the house. She barely ate. And we're supposed to, when people are hurting, we should go take them food, help them clean up their house, right. sit and talk to them, maybe watch their children for them. Every day. There's something going on with somebody in life. And God says if you can just meet them where they are, loosen their burdens. This is the fast I'm asking you to do. Be selfless. Some people don't want to hear Jesus. Maybe you can just show them. Show them Jesus. Amen. Become practical. I remember one time, this person, and I, eventually I just gave him my coat. Because in the end, it's like I can pray for them, but they're outside cold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of coats at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the richest person, but I got at least about three or four coats. Mm -hmm. You know, give them some food. A lot of times they really, you just giving money, eventually they'll be gone. But if you can actually come and actually give them food, or maybe teach them how to grow their own food, yeah. you know? Teach them how to shop, teach them how to budget. So even if they're on welfare, they know how to manage their money better. Because some people are actually decent on welfare. Sometimes it can get overshadowed by the people who are just really living just because, and popping out babies just because. We can lose the fact that there are people really in need. And they don't know how to actually spend their money wisely or buy in bulk or even how to cook. Okay? These are some of the things we want to be practical and teach people. Educate. Educate, educate, educate. But also educate that drugs is not the answer. Now, I will say drugs are good for emergency purposes. 
had a lady had her high blood pressure up to like 300 or 400, over 200. And we were like, and she's like, I'm driving home. And her home drive was 12 hours. So yes, she spent $600 for a pen that was going to thin out her blood to at least help her get halfway. And then she had to shoot herself again to get her the rest of the way. I will promise you, Natural Remedies was not going to get her. <laughs> and not for as high as she was. You know what I'm saying? So there's a, there's a way of utilizing medication. OK? But really, Natural Remedies can take care of, which I'm going to show you some things you can do. Natural Remedies can take care of a lot of things. As well as we need to let people know disease is an effort of the nature to free the system of, from condition that is result from a violation of the laws of health. So the same as fevers, the body's just trying to heal you. So you may get worse before you get better, but you're going to get better, you know? Now here is now just for women. These are actual quotes just for women. And I think because of how our society has belittled women, maybe even women in church feel this way, that the nature of just a woman and her character and her demeanor and her softness and her sweetness is just not good enough anymore. Discreet, humble women can do a good work with explaining truth to people in their homes. The word of God, thus explained, will do a leavening work through the influence of whole families to be converted. Women can actually talk to whole families that men sometimes cannot do. They'll listen to us. We're just that soft, sweet mother, sister, daughter. But that calmness, that gentleness is what we have. In the home circle, at the neighborhood, fireside, the bedside of the sick, in a quiet way, we may read the scriptures and speak a word for Jesus in truth. Precious seeds may thus be sown that will spring up and bring forth days after. So we can talk like this and it'll be okay. Now, if men do it, I mean, people don't know. <laughs> but if women do it, it's like, oh, you know? And don't take that for granted. Because I remember I went into a place of some elderly, and I thought we should sing like this. And them people like, mm, 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 calm that down. Calm that down. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to get live, but they were like, no, 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 calm down. And so I realized it's okay to talk like this and be calm. <laughs> It's very hard for me, but I've learned how to do it. <laughs> we greatly need consecrated women who, as messengers of mercy, shall visit mothers and children in their homes and help them every day, household duties if need be, before beginning to talk to them regarding for the truth of time. So I get it. Jesus is coming soon, and that's true. Mm. The Sabbath is the true day. But honestly, there's a lot of people who just don't know how to clean, don't know how to cook, don't know how to teach their children. I don't know if you've heard women. You need to shut up. I'm just thinking, she's one. She's one. Why are you talking to a one-year-old that way? They talk to them like they're friends. Some people don't know how to be parents. That's where we come in. And I remember one of my friends just brought it to my mind. He's an atheist. He just brought it to my mind. He said, Raven, you have this boldness. He said, because I did. I saw this woman, and she lit her son up outside the store. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, if you don't talk to a young male in front of people in a disrespectful way, now, you, their pride can't handle that. And you're his mother yelling at him in front of people. You are preparing him to be angry and violent. Young men don't handle that very well. And I, I literally, I just felt led to stop her, like, please, please stop, please stop, please stop. It's just a video game. Please don't talk to your son like that because you don't know what, what, what war you are causing within him and what hatred you're causing in him. Not only will he hate you, but he will beat women. Please, don't talk to your son that way. And he just stood, you should see him, he stood there just this anger look like if he could hit her. And I was like, how often have you talked to him this way? Words are life. Life and death is in the tongue. If you keep calling him a sorry son of a bee, what do you expect? What do you expect? And sometimes we have to understand, people are walking inside, outside of their homes because of, with this anger, or want to be promiscuous because of what they're, what they're getting in their homes. 
And I've asked young girls that too. When you walk out of your house, do you feel like you can be a leader? Or do you feel like you need to be on your back? Which one do you feel like when you walk out your house every morning and come to school? Because there's a warfare when they get out their homes. We have to understand that. We can be able to speak things to mothers, to men, that most people cannot. You will find this method will result in a multitude of souls for the ministry. Women instructors should labor with younger women not to see how much work they can be gained from them, but to win their love and confidence. There's a scripture in the Bible that speaks about how older women are supposed to teach younger women. Well, we've lost that too. <laughs> you know, this, should be such, this is such a disconnect. I, I really do believe that we need to be not just having the young girls with us so they can be on the deacon, you know, deaconess board and be able to take care of some of our duties that we don't want to do. We need to have them because a lot of times we'll find that young girls don't have good relationship with their mothers. This society has turned us against our parents. And so now as women, you can talk to them. Boy, you can even talk to boys because they sometimes have bad relationship with their mothers. And we can be able to say things. I just picked up my nephew from the school and this boy, the mother, oh, I wonder, oh, she, oh, she, oh. <laughs> It was out there a football game, and she got out there cussing up a storm to this man. Man jumped in her face, and she just tackling about to go try to fight the man in his car. So the boy, he takes off his shoes, and he was like, somebody get me something. I'm going to crack this. Da, 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 da. And I'm going to thinking, you know your son can get killed. What, what neighborhood do you think we're in? We're in Southeast D.C. I don't know if you know anything about Southeast D.C. That's where I'm from. If you haven't seen it in my demeanor. <laughs> Don't play. <laughs> but you know, the boy would be killed faster than anybody else. Yes, right. That cop down the street doesn't care what you say. But forget the cop. This man will pull out something quick as day. And it's your fault as a mother. So I saw the kid, and I just, I just grabbed him, and I said, look, look. I said, I don't know you, but I need you to live. I need you to live. You're one of my kings. You are a young black man. I cannot have you die. I need you to live. I need you to calm this down. You fighting over what? It's come and gone. But at any point, if someone gets angry enough, you're dead. And your name will just be remembered for about what? A few, a few days? We'll probably put you on a t-shirt? Talking about rest in peace? <laughs> That's what you want? You want to calm that down. He just sat calm and just looked at me. I said, I want you to live. I don't have to know you to know you're important to me. He just looked at me and said, yes, ma'am. I ain't going to preach to you. I'm out. <laughs> and I walked away from him, you know? But I was to get my nephew like, you need to come on. Come on. <laughs> That's what I was, I was telling my mom. I was telling you, mom, go down the street. <laughs> because the sad thing that happens if enough people jump in away, it's just fightings and shootings, and then it's just crossfire. And that's just how it works where I live. That's why I was telling you to go down the street. I was like, I'm baby, I'm right across from you. I don't care. <laughs> you know. So when this is won, there will be no difficulty about the work. For the workers will be filled with a desire to please. We want our young women excited about the work. Amen. But if you aren't excited about the work, then they're not excited about the work. <laughs> you know? So we can reach other people. And I like this first line, actually. This is the one that really got me the most. Women can learn what needs to be done to reach other women. Maybe you need to learn what it is to reach a person. Learn their wants, their likes, their desires. Not everything I like is what she likes. So I'm not a cookie cutter, and neither are, none of us are. So learn them. Take the time to ask questions, study, be around them, watch them. I'm into poetry. Don't ask me to go read something. I'm not into that. But I love poetry. I love dance. I love music. Now, you don't see me out there dancing, but I like dancing, <laughs> you know? Learn what we like so you can be able to impress us to want to get into the Word of God and get out there and help souls. Relationships help us move towards Christ. And that's the truth. 
And it will be a great blessing unto the work if more women are involved in the sacred work. Where men, ministers cannot enter. Again, they can enter into the families to find access, to listen to sorrows of the press and the oppressed. And let me explain this to you. One thing I've learned is men like to fix. So when they're listening to you talk, it's like, okay, then you need to do this. And do this and do this. And I'm telling you, if you go over here, be good. And it's like, you're not going to listen to me? Then why are you talking to me? <laughs> How long are you going to talk? <laughs> We as women are different. We can listen. We talk. We have much, much more words to say than a man does. And I used to think that was a joke. I used to think that they're just doing that whole men against women thing. No, it's real. The struggle's real. <laughs> they can't handle that. But we can be able to listen. We're good at that. God has built us for that. Um, and so we can pray with them and open up the scriptures and and that's the good thing. That's just the temperament that God has given us. Now, in the church, a lot of times we sit back and say, I want to be the one just preaching the gospel. And that's not a problem either. The spirit process says women can preach too. However, it's the other jobs that we, we, neget, we sometimes can negate. Many things connected with different churches are left undone that women, if properly instructed, could attend to. Our sisters might be served as church clerks and church business would not be so sadly neglected. Let me explain this to you. We have the ability to be so detailed and organized that meetings should never be done just with one sex. That's right. I never think it should be all done with just women, and I never think it should be done with all of just men. God has given us the ability, I don't know if you know this about the human brain, but our brains are not the same. We have different abilities to see. Women can see things much more broader, and men are focused, and God is created in that way. So when we work together, it truly shows the image of God yeah. in all the decisions. I think Satan is the one that wants us to have things just for women and just for men, yeah. and the youth ministries, yeah. and the children's ministries. Yeah. I'll do that. <laughs> God's message with everybody, and God's ways are for everyone. We're supposed to work together. There are many other offices connected with the cause of God which our sisters are better qualified to fill than our brethren in which they might do efficient service. So it is good to be able to be the accountant. We're good with numbers. Have you ever heard that? Your husband gives you all the money and you balance out the budgets in the house? Yes. Now I will say, some women you should not do that with. <laughs> You'd be broke. <laughs> okay. But I think it's imperative that each person learn the strengths in the home. I think that is the key. And when you see that your wife has, or, or your sister, or the female in the home has a stronger strength, or in the church, that's who should do it. I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> so, here's my key. If we're not out doing the work, Satan doesn't stop. But he'll do it without resistance. Nobody's pushing back if we're not out here doing this work. So, the Spirit of Prophecy says, educate, educate, educate. This is what God has told her. The mind must be enlightened, for the understanding of the people is darkened. Satan can find access to the souls through perverted appetite to debase and destroy. Now, if you look at our, our world today, their appetites are truly debased. So that means Satan is having a field day. So, I believe Satan has a cross too. Okay? 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Instead of them having the gospel of peace, they're a very impatient world. Okay? <laughs> hey, I don't know if you've ever seen the video of the first world problems where people start to cry because they don't have a remote control to the television. And the microwave is on the blitz and they have to actually wait for the oven. But it's funny, it is funny, but at the, tr at the you sit back and think about it, we're very impatient. I think that's where road rage come in, okay? That's where a lot of things where you're like, you want it and you want it now. That's why I think pornography and other things I'm not gonna say because the kids are here. <laughs> but I think we have gotten to the point, we are an impatient people. We are very abused people and we abuse very highly. Stealing, when I submit stealing, I also meant stealing joy. Sometimes we're just, mean and evil 
in our nature at times where we just can't just be nice. You just can't say something good. Like, oh, that skirt is so pretty. You know, if you'd have wore it a different way, it'd probably look better on you. Like, you just can't leave a nice comment by itself. <laughs> I've had that happen too many times to me. <clears throat> so much worry, so much unforgiveness have created all kinds of diseases. Breast cancer is a very big thing with women, okay? Uh, selfishness, instead of giving, you take. And depression, instead of the, the mind of Christ. So again, this is the cross we need to bear. We need to help people have Christ's way of living. So this is Galatians 5, 22. And ministry of healing, I kind of summed it up all together, kind of cut it in half. So when you're teaching people, and this is when you're trying to make people disciples, when you start to talk to them, you want to help them see that your patient heart, God will give you peace because you'll find a lot of people cannot come to God because God won't forgive them. I don't know if you've met people like that. I'm too bad, I've done so much wrong, and they want to tell you all their sins. And you'll find that because for them, they really see their wretchedness and say, I can't go to church. I'm too nasty, I've done this, and they want to tell you all this, and I'm like, don't tell me anything. God can still cleanse this. And then they can't see, well, how will God utilize my past issues? And this is what I think. How many of you have ever seen this in a, in a spirit of prophecy in ministry of healing? Christ's way. Christ's way. Yeah. Mingled with men for their good. So when you have been an impatient person, you've hurt people, when God started to give you peace, he gives you the ability to be able to mingle with people for their good because you've been there. Yeah. And this is also for yourself. As well as if you've been abused or have abused other people, he gives you a gentleness. and You'll be able to show more sympathy unto people. If you've been a thief and a stealer, you want to give joy unto people. Same way Paul was, to be able to meet people's needs. And that breast cancer that you had, he makes you a little bit more long-suffering. Okay? So you're able to utilize his methods easier and better. That self-initial will be gone because he gives you faith. And you'll be able to win people's confidence. Amen. And so instead of depression, you'll have his goodness. And you obey people to follow him. Amen. People need to see what God can do. You need to see that he can make you like Saul to Paul. And people don't have faith in that, but you will be able to show them through your life, we must die for someone to be able to live. Because greater works. Now this is where the practical part comes in, that we can do. This is the sanctuary and you still got me? Good, okay. This is the sanctuary, but this is the, this is the medical missionary work in the sanctuary. So, everyone has come up with the eight laws of health, okay? I've come up, mine is serenity. I think uh, Thomas Jackson is God's plan, you know? So we all come up with our own. I think that God should be first. There's no consistency without God. And the next thing is, we need to teach people to go to sleep. People have high blood pressure because they don't go to sleep at night. They have depression because they don't go to sleep at night. They actually can develop cancer because at 12 o'clock, this is what happens. In the daytime, your body gets to get the suns and the rays. So by nighttime, you usually start to feel yourself get hungry. Anybody feel hungry right around 5, 6, 7 o'clock? Okay? That's not your body telling you that you're hungry. It's actually telling you to stop eating. Your hunger signal is three things, and we'll get to that on the next one. Um, but it's telling you to stop eating because by 9 o'clock, it wants to rest your body to push off melatonin in your body, okay? The melatonin will actually start to heal the body, heal the blood clots, any damages, the toxins that's in the bloodstream. By 12 o'clock, it sends off another hormone to start healing the DNA that's breaking down into cancer cells. But if that doesn't happen, it stays in the bloodstream and it just keeps building. And then you wonder why a person who's a vegan can get cancer. Make sense? Yeah. It's sad, but it's true. Water, how much of the brain is made of water? 80%. The body, 70% water. The cells, water. The bones, water. Dehydration is one of the major reasons why there are sicknesses in people in the hospital. Many people are not drinking enough water, and we'll get to a formula of what the amount of water that each person should be drinking, because a glass you'll find is not enough, especially for the average person. Endurance movement is just exercising. Running is one of the worst exercises you can do. Walking is the best. 
Running with any other aerobic exercise, it actually locks all the blood in the thighs, which is not a problem. But the problem is when you're actually running, your body can handle it to a certain degree. If it starts to go too long, it lets off cortisol. You might know what cortisol is? Your stress hormones, that's our closing arteries. You start closing arteries too long, you're creating a lot of blood clots, and you're creating an issue where it's congestion of blood in the bloodstream and there's not enough blood going to the heart. And your whole structure is coming down on itself without enough padding, and especially when you run on stuff like this. Very damaging. If anything, go run the grass, the sand, <laughs> things like that. But when you have, when you're walking, actually all the organs are able to let off impurities through the capillaries into the bloodstream, letting off toxins. And the toxins come out of the fat cells, and you're able to lose more weight. Your largest muscles is right here in the thighs. If you ever want to lose that lower pouch, walk more, do squats, do something like that. <laughs> No. Now, you can walk too long with the wrong shoes. When you start to feel that tightness in your back, that means your arches probably has been now weighing down because you're probably wearing a, a, a shoe that is not supporting your arch, which supports your back and your spine. And that's my problem. My, my arch is actually low. So I feel the pain at my back if I walk too long. Um, needed regularity. A lot of people say, oh, you mean just go to the bathroom. No, actually, when you eat, drink, sleep, when you get up, your body works on a cycle. If it doesn't, if it's not that it actually starts producing diseases, mainly, let's say, if you eat at 7 o'clock, okay, and tomorrow you eat at 9 o'clock, and then the next day you eat at 11 o'clock, your body doesn't know when to set off the acids, and it has to do the whole digestive system to start to be able to digest any food. So as soon as you put food in, but it's at a different time that it's not prepared for, what it does, it has to start all the way down up. So that means the food is one sitting in the acid of the stomach and rotting. It starts there. Anything that's not digestible turns into fat and toxins in the blood. But if you eat at the right time, then it's actually prepared for food to come and start digesting the food properly. Okay? Something like that. Um, the same is invigorating atmosphere. I believe in fresh air. I also believe in being around negativity. Can also cause some issues. You know, if your home environment is dark, that tells me you're depressed. If negative people are around you, that starts bringing down your psyche. You know, you need an atmosphere and invigoration from people, your home life, your neighborhood. If you're constantly hearing gunshots, sirens, that does something to a person. And you're going to find people are dealing with that, and you're wondering what's wrong with them, why they're always scared, why they're looking behind their back, why they're always doubting or questioning. You know, They're defensive. Look at their environment. It has created a mentality. Okay. Next thing is testing your faith. Yes, temperance, smoking, drinking, I get it. However, this is the bigger part. Like, let, let's say what we've heard today. Okay. Now, let's say you want to start wearing high heels again. That's just, yeah. This is where your faith is tested. When you say, Lord, I want my high heels. I need you to help me with that. Every day you're going to be tested on, should I eat my cheese? Knowing cheese should not be entered into the body. But Pete, you can't tell me cashews is going to taste like cheese. Okay, how much yeast flakes you put in it? <laughs> Cashew cheese will never taste like cheese. <laughs> This is where your faith is tested, when you know what to do right and are you going to do it? Because the word of God has told you. I love shrimp. I love crabs. I love pork. I love, ch you know, Chesapeake Bay. I love steak and cheese. I didn't stop eating it because it was nasty. I stopped eating it because of my faith. But it was always good and it still smelled good. But I choose not to eat it. And I just say that. <laughs> your internal protection is your nutrition. Okay? What you eat. You can't keep eating rat poisoning and expecting to live. And just know this, 90% of rat poisoning is actually good, healthy food that we can eat. It's only the 3% that kills them. Okay? You want to watch what you're putting in your body. Okay? Anything you fry, you can fry a Brussels sprout. It will harden your arteries and thicken your blood because the frying process, period, is damaging, okay? So just keep that in mind. So just watch what you're putting in your body and know what you're supposed to be eating. Anything that's fresh is always better. 
because the foods that are alive, it actually goes into the cells and it sees free radicals and it, it dies for you. That's the beautiful part. It dies for you and it starts putting electrons back onto the cells and then it's no longer a free radical. And it's there to give you energy for the body again. That's the beautiful thing about food. I love it, okay. <laughs> Next thing is natural remedies. So if you have a person, anybody want to sit down here for me? Yeah, sure. Ching. Oh. <laughs> 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 Amen. See, I didn't have to get no. <laughs> that was easy. Stand up for me real quick. Now, I want you, what you would do, now this is going to be good for, for a person because it is almost, almost, almost. If you have a person that have a headache, high blood pressure, or cramps, you can be able to, instead of giving them Tylenol, you actually can give them a hot foot bath. And just change a few things, okay? So, what we're gonna do, we have a sheet, and we have a blanket, can you sit right here? Let me get this basin. So what you would do, the whole point of hydrotherapy is to cause circulation. Anytime you're causing circulation, bacteria goes to the bloodstream, go to the bone marrow, destroys it, and put out new blood. And that's the key of what you want. Anytime you bring in heat, can you put your feet in there? Here you go. Anytime you put heat anywhere, what happens is red and white blood cells come to the charge, okay? And then when you put cold, it actually constricts and then pushes the bacteria, whatever is fighting, out. We got that so far? That's pretty much hydrotherapy, all right? Hot opens up the, the vessels, anything and rushes in white and red blood cells, okay? So when a person is, let's say she has a headache, what I would do is I would have ice water here, okay? And I'll put a cloth in the ice water, and I will take her and I will wrap her, I'm gonna wrap you like a little mummy. Little mummy, yeah, okay, hold on. Little mummy, yes you are little mummy. And then, because we want her to sweat. See, you're forcing the circulation, okay? When they're not moving, when they're sitting down, you want to force the circulation. So you will wrap them up, and you will wrap them really, 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 really tight. And so what you would do is you end up putting this cold pack on their head. Now, you wonder why you're putting the cold pack on their head? <laughs> Y'all probably all said the right answer, I just don't know. <laughs> the key is a lot of heat will push up to the brain. I think you all said that. And so this will constrict it and make sure that they don't get a headache in the process, okay? The heat, we're gonna put hot water now. The hot water will rush the blood down, okay? Now, the key is you want to also keep cold water near you because you don't wanna scorch their feet, their nerves. For a diabetic, don't have the water over 100 or 102 because they will not be able to truly feel if it's really hot and you can burn their nerves, okay? So you're constantly, what you want to do and make sure you do this, you would ask the person to lift up their feet and you would lift it over and you would put the water in, hot water in, and you would feel it. A lot of times it's best to feel it with your elbows because your hand can stand a whole lot, but your elbows can tell you the truth. But you'll have them just tap it if they can say, oh, I can, I can handle it, say, no, 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 if you're burning, we can't have that. But if you can handle the heat, that is the best. And you keep doing that for as long as it really takes. Usually it doesn't take no more than 15 to 20 minutes. Now, if they're having high blood pressure, you'll keep the same process. But you'll add also, if you have a heating pad, some people have fomentations, but if you have a heating pad, especially if you have one that has a cloth to it and you can wet the cloth, put that on their kidneys. Your kidneys regulate your blood pressure, okay? And it can lower your blood pressure. So you make sure you take their blood pressure beforehand and then you take it afterwards to make sure that it's been coming down, okay? The next one is if they're cramping, do not put heat on the stomach. And a lot of people do that. And it's best to put ice on the stomach because you're trying to push blood away because there's a congestion there, okay? So, you are not a mummy anymore. <laughs> you are free at last, free at last. Bye-bye now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are you speaking also uh, menstrual cramps or just cramping? Uh, Use menstrual cramps, but if you have any kind of cramping in the stomach, again, it's probably better for the stomach. If you have, it's most likely if it's the stomach, it's gas. Yeah. Any, anytime this area is really your intestines, it's not your tummy, your tummy's up here. And so this is really your intestines. A lot of times heat can help with that because it's, it's helping you expand and you want to drink nice warm lemon water as well, okay? Um, contrast treatments. The same is, again, if you have hot and cold and it's, let's say if it's even your face. Okay, that's pretty much how you do it. Because it's two minutes, and don't try to hold your breath for two minutes. Usually people use straws or those little things where people go snorkeling in, okay? Or you do the different parts of your body. Like I said, when I was trying to heal myself of fibroids, I put my whole body in hot water and my whole body in a big old, they had a big old basin of cold water and I was able to just go all the way down in it. And it's stinging, but eventually after a while you'll love it you'll be craving that cold water. <laughs> you will crave it like none other. So if you ever have a cold, you feel a cold coming on, suck on some lemon, jump into the shower, turn that water up as hot as you can, stand over it for two minutes, then turn it as cold as you can stand it for 30 seconds to a minute, okay? Now, the first time grown men cry. <laughs> so don't worry about it. But by the second or third time, you will be loving it. Like, give me that cold. Sometimes people can pass out. So if you're actually doing it with someone, always ask, is it too hot? Are you OK? Because some people can pass out, OK? After you do a treatment like this or a contrast treatment, you want to go lay down after 20 minutes. You want to end with cold, lay down for 20 minutes. Don't think. The only thing you're able to do is pray. Other than that, you want nothing truly pulling the blood back up to the brain because as your body is trying to destroy all the bacteria that it has been fighting against, you don't want to congest it back in the brain. So no talking on the phone, no doing nothing, just lay there, sleep, do whichever. At least 20 minutes allow the body to rest and circulate. Um, for the herbs you can use, I don't know if you all are garlic people, one of the things that you'll have in the handouts that they'll have on the website for you all is I have a list. Um, colds and flus, arthritis, all the different herbs you can use for various diseases and various things. One of the key things I say is easy, everyone can get, no matter who you're dealing with, rich or poor, is an onion, a garlic, <laughs> and a lemon. Powerhouse right here. And my mother would, whoo, whoo, I thought it was evil. She would say, Raven, just eat a lemon, just eat an onion raw. I have perfected just putting it in my jaw and just eating it in my jaw. And you can handle it then if you just put it in your jaw, okay? But these right here boost your immune system. If a person having, oh, that's what I wanted to show. Okay. I'm going to do this. I wasn't planning on doing this because it actually is a lot. But if anyone knows anyone that has asthma, have asthma attacks. Okay. My friend was very strong about not using her inhaler. So she would have asthma attacks. So we've gotten her down from two hours of having an asthma attack down to like 10 minutes. Her lungs are so strengthened right now, she doesn't even use anything at all. She barely even have asthma attacks. So, no. <laughs> I need someone I can actually pounce on. Okay. <laughs> I want you to sit this way. So, no, you can sit right here. Okay. I'm doing, yeah. <laughs> And this is serious now, I need you to stay calm when you're doing this treatment because you need to keep them calm. The issue with people who are as having asthma attacks is that they're sucking the air in but they can't get the air out. And so they're hyperventilating, they're freaking out over this. You have to keep them calm. There's two things you wanna do. One, you want them drinking something that causes them to cough. I say always try to have onions or ginger garlic and water and crush it up and make them drink it. One, anything with onions and onions and garlic actually opens up the vessels in the lungs, okay? You can even put a poultice on the feet and one on the chest and it actually will start to help people with pneumonia or any kind of issues when it comes to their lungs way before they have it, if they have it often. But if a person's actually having an asthma attack, 
You want them drinking, trying to drink the drink, okay? And it forces them to cough. Coughing is good because they get that air out because their compression on the chest is deadening to them, okay? So you're getting them to cough, but you put ice bags on their chest and you put ice on their back. You want to freeze their lungs and they will be freezing. Cold water, if you want to even put them over a tub in cold water, and when you lean them over, it will be just like this. And you would do the same thing to the front of their chest. You're breaking up the mucus. You're freezing the mucus, and you're breaking it up. And you would do this until they start to breathe on their own. And you will find eventually their lungs will start to just get stronger. Because the, you can, you can stand, you can stand. <laughs> the, 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 Inhalers are weakening their lungs to have the ability to handle chemicals, dust, to the point that they're just now having asthma attacks and they can't control it. You had your hand up? You would do it until they can't, until they can breathe, until they can breathe. Like I said, I, garlic. If you even have just one of them, that's 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 good, and it forces it. It's something that they they body will like. Oh, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want this. That's good. Because that's what you need them to do to get the air out, because they're going to keep sucking in. And you do it until they breathe. So now, my friend, if we had the last time, I think it took us 10 minutes, and she was done. So that's the way. But you have to stay calm. You stay prayerful. And in all treatments, make sure you pray beforehand, because God is the one who's really going to do the work. And he's going to keep you calm and bring you wisdom of things you may forget. OK? Um, what time is it? Because I'm probably running over my time. Oh, I'm going to go fast. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So the demonstrations are done. Um, I'll just say this quickly. Chaseberry tea, that was one of the biggest things I used for getting rid of my fibroids. Chaseberry tea and molasses. Okay? Um, huh? Chaseberry tea. So get the berries. Um, and I'll show you a picture of what the chaseberries look like. Uh, Turmeric. Good for pain, inflammation. If you don't know anything else, you know those two things. Someone says I got arthritis pain, I'm in pain, any kind of pain, <laughs> inflammation. Turmeric is great for that, ginger is great for that. And Russian penicillin, take a whole lemon. If it's organic, you can just throw the whole thing in there. If it's not, peel it. At least three to five cloves of garlic, a fourth of an onion, and four cups of water. Put that in a blender, Drink that up, and that's your Russian penicillin. Boy, are you talking about knocking out some colds? You talking about knocking out some flus? Oh, you're good to go. <laughs> you're good to go. But this, this was the hydrotherapy treatment. What you looking for, baby? Clipboard. The clipboard. Oh, it's right here. Oh, oh no, no, go back, go back. Oh, no, man. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay, that's what the chase spray teas look like. The capsules didn't work anything for me, okay? The powder, none of that stuff worked for me. The actual berries. And so what you do is you take a cup of those berries, you put it in four cups of water, and you let it boil. You strain that. After you, after you let it steep for 20 minutes, you strain that. I usually use a quart jar. I pour it in a quart jar. You'll realize the four cups have kind of steamed out. And whatever's left, that whatever space from the top of the water down to the tea, you fill that with molasses. Shake that up. Trust and believe you want molasses with it. Because the chase berry is like stinging nettle <laughs> to your throat. Okay? So, and it actually tastes pretty good if you get the mixture right. <laughs> okay? But what you want to do is take three tablespoons three times a day. My fibroids are gone within a year. Chase berries. Um, I've tried to find them online, but the cheapest I've found is going back to Wildwood, where I, where I was. Wildwood Lifestyle Center Hospital, they have an herb store. I just order it over, online. And I just got it in bulk now. Yeah. Um, this is something that I just wanted to share with you. When people are arguing about protein, keep this formula. It's weight times 2.2.2 two two kilograms times eight. That will tell a person how much protein they really need a day. Over that amount is destroying your kidneys. And people don't talk about that. Animal products, that, that kind of protein is way too heavy for our kidneys. Um, 
the basic digestion of fruits, vegetables, and beans, two to three hours, you know, three to four hours, grains, five, four to five hours. It's just giving the ability of the digestion to rest, yes. You can have all, of, I'm giving you all of the presentations and, and handouts, everything. So that's why I can run through this right now so you all. <laughs> I will send that one to you. I will definitely put that on there as well. Yes. the drinks oh boy <laughs> everybody want to know your business now girl. <laughs> um okay so when you're pregnant um they recommend you eat every you know three hours two hours or what have you sometimes and you need to have a lot of water when you're pregnant you know 120 ounces mm -hmm. 150 ounces a day sometimes i'm drinking so what is that doing to my digestive system when i'm eating this way well if you're actually let's say if you're doing fruits two to three hours, that means it's literally out of the stomach, okay? And water can be taken in an hour afterwards. Water can be taken in pretty much after vegetables about an hour, an hour and a half afterwards. But after anything with nuts, grains, and beans, water cannot be taken in until at least about two hours. And see, the thing is, the reason why they, what they're not telling you is that solids and liquids are not to be mixed together. And this is, and she said, and you get thirsty. <laughs> And so, in getting thirsty, that means a few things have happened. One, when you woke up in the morning and throughout the morning before you ate, you didn't drink enough water. You have to at least drink two cups of water for your digestion to be able to digest your food properly 30 minutes before you're about to eat, okay? So, um, two cups of water, at least, um, for your digestion to be able to digest your food properly. The next thing is you need to get a lot of water in your food. So you should be eating more watery fruits. I know. I eat all the time. I know. I'm not pregnant. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can only give you the facts that I've been told. <laughs> but, you know, more salads, more tomatoes, you know, things like that that has water base. And that will be in your food so you're not mixing it. And then right after you're done eating, you start drinking more water. Okay, and that's really how it's supposed to be if you're drinking more water. Now, as I've never been pregnant, so I can't tell you what to do. But what, I, what I've been told is the digestion really still doesn't change, though. Um, and it, to be able to, because it's not even about how much you eat, it's what you eat. The body needs to do something very different with proteins from nuts than it does in, in vegetables. Um, but that's what I have. But I will ask my doctor that's on my staff <laughs> about that when it comes to pregnancy. <laughs> um, rehydration. Here we go. Your hunger signal is three things. Eat, drink, don't eat. We're the only creatures on this earth that does not have a thirsty signal. When you feel thirsty, you're dehydrated and the organ is crying out saying, I need fluids. I can't circulate. I can't get impurities out. Okay, so if you ever want to know how much water you should be drinking, take your weight, divide it by two, that tells you how many ounces you need a day. Divide that by eight, it tells you how many glasses you need a day. That's all. And you just keep doing that. And this is for you just to sit there without any exercise, just to exist. And try to eat more raw foods to get, you know, <laughs> your water base. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. So here we go. For prayer and meditation, I say teach people how to find Jesus in the Word of God. Also, find out when they're reading the Scripture what principles God are trying to show them for that day. The Bible said, don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. And then how to pray and seek, you know, God to embody him for that day and how to apply for that day. The next thing is how to make them disciples. Be letters read by men, share the word of God, and teach. Teach them how to teach others. And they'll, it'll solidify more if you teach them how to teach others and have the mind of Christ. And this is where I want to stress more than anything else. Please learn how to deal with people who've been abused, who have depression. There are a lot of women. One of the things I learned when I was in seminary is that the most abused women are pastor's wives. And that's mainly because our men do not have anyone they can go to to talk to when they're hurting. And they can, when they feel like they can't talk to God, 
and they, have, and they can't talk to their peers because their peers are wondering, why are you doing it? You're a man of God. La, 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 la. They abuse their wives. And so I think we as a church need to learn how to be a little bit more supportive to issues of what's going on. One lady said she felt alienated from the church because her husband divorced her. Her husband left her, <laughs> and she felt alienated, you know? So I think one of the key things is to have the presence of God, his law and his mercy, and to be self-sacrificing. So everything is about living a sanctuary life. Everything. Regaining Eden one decision at a time. May God bless you all. <laughs> Who that was last? <laughs> I need a couple of water, girl. <laughs> I need a couple. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> George wants to make sure I tell him. How many of you have been enjoying this day? I think God has truly blessed us today. And he's going to continue to bless us. Remember what we talked about this morning and us being out here and reaching the people? I, the church was willing to get the books for us, and so I'm telling you, please, please put some offering back in evangelism. Okay, when you're making out your checks for the offering next week so they can go back into evangelism because the church did get all of those books for us to go out. We are going to meet in the room over there right after the meeting for those who want to go out this evening. Sister Genevieve said that she wanted to go out. I don't see her right now, but there she is. And Brother Raphael said that he wanted to go out this evening. And then the rest, there's some others. I think Sister Marable and Sister Pennington, I uh, might want to take their children out tomorrow. But you can join those who have already said they want to go out. So meet us in the room right after closing prayer. And we shall get ready to give people the word of God. We will now have our closing hymn. If you would all turn in your hymns with me to 505, I Need the Prayers. And you're going to have to help me because sometimes I don't remember how it goes. And I went over it a little bit with Sister Inez, but certainly I need your help so that we can all stand. 505. I need the prayers of those I love While traveling of life's rugged way That I may true and faithful be And live for Jesus every day I want my friends to pray for me To bear my tempted soul above Seed with God for me. I need the prayers of those I love. I need the prayers of those I love to help me in each trying hour, to bear my tempted soul to Him, that He may keep me by His power. I want my friends to pray for me, to bear my tempted soul above, and intercede with God for me. I need the prayers of those I love. I want my friends to pray for me. To hold me up on wings of faith That I may walk the narrow way That keeps from my flock of grace I want my friends to pray for me To bear my tempted soul above And in to 
intercede with God for me. I need the prayers of those I love. May we remember to pray for one another as sisters. Well, everyone, we are so glad that most of you stayed. We hope that you were blessed by today's messages. There's just one final quote I want to read from the Spirit of Prophecy, because Sister White, Raven White, just told us about medical missionary work, did she not? Amen. Listen to this quote. This is taken from Ministry of Healing, and it says, true education is missionary training. Every son and daughter of God is called to be a missionary. Did you know that? Amen. If you're an Adventist, you're in this movement, you are a missionary. Amen. We are called to the service of God and our fellow men. And to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. I pray that you all will seek out medical missionary training no matter what the cause, because we have been called to be medical missionaries if you are a part of this movement. We thank you so much for staying. We thank you so much for supporting this event. And for those, we pray that you were blessed. For the sisters who took the challenge, I pray that you pray today and that God will reveal his plan and will tell you exactly the work that he has for you. And I promise by the end of the day, he will answer that for you. We thank you. Everyone is dismissed at this time. got confused there. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for this high Sabbath that you have truly blessed. We thank you for the daughters of God that you have given us to do a work in this time. We pray even for the sons of God because you have given them as well, Lord. And we pray that we can all come together and do our part in finishing the work. We ask that you will continue to be with us in this evening. Grant us traveling mercies as we make it back to our homes. And Lord, we ask that you would just bless us in a special way, as it is in accordance with your will. For this we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. For those of you that are interested in Raven's uh, getting her materials for today, there's a clipboard going around. Andy. So please make sure that you sign up on it so that she can send you the information. That's via email. Thank you.